Long live the king. Colossians chapter 1 describes the king in these words. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we cannot see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. Father in heaven, as we spend time, as we spend time thinking and meditating, as we spend time in your word, as we spend time in fellowship with one another, our hearts cry out, long live the king. And you, Jesus, you are this king, this king of kings, this lord of lords, the one who subjected himself to this world, to its sufferings, to its death, so that the subjects of your kingdom, us, may live eternally with you. And so in our hearts we bow before you this morning, we acknowledge you as the king. And we say this morning, long live the king. Amen. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 24, Paul goes on to say, after that great hymn, after that spoken word that I just read to you, he goes on in verse 24 to say, I am glad when I suffer for you in my body, for I am participating in the sufferings of Christ that continue for his body, the church. God has given me the responsibility of serving his church by proclaiming his entire message to you. This message was kept secret for centuries and generations past, but now it has been revealed to God's people. For God wanted them to know that the riches and glory of Christ are for you, the Gentiles. And this is the secret, the grand secret that was kept secret for ages gone by. This is the secret. Christ lives in you. This gives you the assurance of sharing his glory. In other translations, more formal translations say, Christ in you, the hope of glory. So we tell others about Christ, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all the wisdom that God has given us. We want to present them to God, perfect in their relationship to Christ. That's why I work and struggle so hard, depending on Christ's mighty power that works within me. What I want you to notice first about this passage is that it comes after the, that, grand, that grand passage, that spoken word, that hymn that extols the grandness of who's, who Christ is. He is the pre-incarnate, the, the God of all eternity, dressed up in human flesh, who has come into this world. And then he goes on to say, in light of that, because of that, because God took suffering upon himself, I choose to suffer with him. This God sense. became man to suffer alone. Alongside me. And so I find him worthy of my adoration, worthy of my affection, worthy of my worship, because this God, this God himself does not serve power, but serves the very creation that he brought into existence. And Paul says, I want to be like him. I want to be like this God. He is worthy of my adoration and my worship, but he's also worthy of my imitation. Paul's, Paul's testimony here in these few verses, verses 24 to the end of the chapter, his testimony is his, his life is transformed because of his hope in Christ. That's the second thing I want you to notice about this passage. This passage, it not only comes in the context of the greatness of who Christ is, of who God is in Christ, but it has the tone of hope and hope transforms because where there is hope, there is a picture, there is a something that is greater than any one individual. Where there is hope, there is something that transcends the brokenness and the pain and the disappointment. Where there is hope, there is something that motivates us, that drives us forward. And get this, it's a positive motivation. 
There's plenty of negative motivation in the world. Hey, there's plenty of negative motivation in Christianity. You've heard sermons where you've been urged to tell your neighbors about Christ because Jesus died for you. And isn't that the least that you could do for him? Playing to your guilt complex. And I'm not saying there's no truth in that because he has offered up much and it should awaken the offering of much within us. But notice that the motivation of hope is always forward looking. The motivation of hope is something that drives us with a positive mindset. We are striving towards something. We're going somewhere. There's direction to history. There's direction to my life. And that direction gives me wisdom for daily living. Because when I know where I'm going, I know which roads to avoid. Hope. Listen to what he says again. I'm glad when I suffer. I'm glad. What kind of crazy, insane person says something like that? Suffering is painful. Suffering is unpleasant. Suffering is not something that any normal, rational person looks in the mirror every morning and goes, another day of suffering. I'm just so looking forward to this. We spend our lives avoiding suffering. Have you ever thought about that? It's why you don't touch a hot stove. Suffering is why you take pain medications. Suffering is why you avoid certain people. Suffering is something that's it's bad. We don't look forward to suffering, and yet hope has transformed the mindset of this author. And he says now, he said, my hope, my trajectory, my direction, the place where I'm going to, the place where all of history is going to, the place where I'm going to, makes me want to suffer in this world, not for my own foolishness, not for my own stupidity, not because of because of the indulgence of sin, not that kind of suffering, but I'm willing to put myself out. I'm willing to put my desires aside. I'm willing to to slog hard, to work hard for the salvation of others. I'm willing to be misunderstood. I'm willing to be uh, 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 maligned. I'm willing to be to be to be persecuted. I'm willing to go to dangerous places. I'm willing to be shipwrecked, if you know anything about the the, the story of this author captured in the book of Acts. You'll know he's not just talking the talk. His life exemplified some of the worst suffering in history. And eventually he died because of his hope. He wakes up every morning and he says, I am glad When I suffer for you, do you know that it notice that it's a selfless suffering? Again, just to reiterate, it's not suffering because he's made foolish choices or because he's choosing sin and he's inviting all sorts of brokenness into his life. He's not he's not saying we should relish that kind of suffering. He's saying, I am glad to suffer for you. To pour out my life, to so orient my choices in my life that I live for something other than me, for something other than my comfort, for something other than my pleasure. This is truly a remarkable frame of mind. And it is because of the mystery that is hidden in Christ. This is what he builds to. He starts off with the reality of his life. He says, he says I am glad when I suffer for you in my body, for I am participating in the sufferings of Christ that continue for his body, the church. To belong to Christ is to share the glory of Christ. True, to belong to Christ is all things positive and all things salvation and all things hopeful for the future, but to belong to Christ is a call to suffer. It was Dietrich Bonhoeffer, famous German theologian, who said, When Christ bids a man follow me, he bids him come die. Digest that. Follow me, come die. But the gospel is the upside down kingdom. Because it was Jesus who said, That he who seeks to save his life, he who seeks to employ his life in serving himself, will lose it for eternity. But he who loses his life for my sake will gain it for eternity. It's like it's the upside down kingdom. I mean, we're taught in this world that if you want money, you save money. That if you want something, you hoard it. And Christ comes along and he turns that exactly the other way around and he says, in the limitless kingdom of eternity, in the limitless kingdom of heaven, with a limitless 
resources of the omnipotent, all-powerful God. He says, it's exactly the opposite. What you put on the line, what you give away, makes all the difference in the world, and you do not lose what you have given. Paul says, I am glad to suffer for you, the body of Christ. I am glad to be in service for you. I'm glad to give up my dreams and my aspirations and everything that I might do for myself in this world because there's a different principle that works in me. And it's because of the hope that I have. Never underestimate the power of hope to shape, to provide endurance, to motivate. And as hope is defined not as anything in this world, his hope is defined entirely and squarely in the relationship that he enjoys with his bestest of best friends. I know that was bad English. With his bestest of best friends, Jesus Christ. He says, I've come to know him. I've seen him. And Paul had seen him. He saw him on that road. On a road to his own will, to his own purpose, building his own kingdom. That road to Damascus, where he was, where he was foolishly in the name of God, pursuing his own dreams and his own visions and his own aspirations of greatness. Along that road, a road which many of us have traveled, Christ confronted him. And revealed himself to him and said to him, Paul, my paraphrase, Paul, I love you. There's a different way. He was filled with hope and it changed the direction and the course of his life. And I want to suggest to you that everyone sitting in this room has some kind of hope, some kind, some variety of hope. If you had no hope, if you were the true, absolute, philosophical pessimist, you'd probably be struggling with suicidal tendencies. Because where there is no hope, there is no point. See, all of us have some kind of hope. The challenge is, the challenge for us is that some of us have a hope that only lasts to tomorrow. Some of us have a hope that is only rooted in what we hope will happen with our children. Some of our hopes are, are to do with our financial aspirations and the ambitions of this world, which, which may last a few years and which can be swept away with a sudden implosion of the economic situation. Some of us, we all live in some picture of hope. Some of us have a very myopic, short-sighted hope. Some have a medium-term hope, but it is only when you discover the eternal hope in Christ... That anything this world sends your way is worth living for or, or worth living through. God has given me the responsibility of serving His church by proclaiming His entire message to you. This message was kept secret for centuries and generations past, but now it has been revealed to God's people. For God wanted them to know that the riches and the glory of Christ are for you Gentiles too. Everyone assumed that the Jewish nation was the favorite of God. That was their claim. That was what people saw. That's how they lived their lives. But the revolution was that all of us were entitled to the same blessings. Because I would be willing to bet that there's very few people, maybe not even one here, with a truly Jewish heritage, which makes all of us the Gentiles. Every single one of us sitting here are Gentiles. And even if you have some Jewish blood in you, you're probably a crossbreed. Does that make sense? The Gentiles have hope because of Christ. You and me today are offered this picture in Christ. And this is the secret, that Christ lives in you, not far distant, not out there somewhere in a universe yet to make his appearance. He says, here, here is what, this is how our hope thrives. This is how our hope lives. Because although you may not see him with your eyes, although you may not touch him with your hands, he has made it possible that you can know him with your heart as verily as you know the person you've chosen to spend the rest of your life with, the person whom you love, whom you are married to. You know them not just because they're physically present with you. There's something inside of your heart that resonates with you, with them. And, and, and the scriptures give this idea that that same relational connectedness can exist between you and the one you have not yet seen with your eyes, Jesus Christ. Now, it's not mentioned in this particular passage, but it happens through the presence of the Holy Spirit. He's the one who makes it real, and He's very much alive and amongst us today. 
And he speaks to us of the historical Jesus. He speaks to us of the present day Jesus. He speaks to us of the Jesus of the future who is to return to take his children home. And this Holy Spirit enables you and me to have the mystery of Christ present today. The hope of our glory, the assurance, hope is a, is a future-looking future assurance. Does that make sense? Hope is a future-looking assurance. You have assurance, a guarantee, because you know Him, because you experience Him today in a way that's beyond science, in a way that science cannot speak to. It can neither confirm nor deny, but you can experience the reality of the living, resurrected Jesus Christ. Paul says, this is why I get up in the morning. This is why, this is why I don't have to use this life to get as much pleasure as I possibly can for myself because there is a world beyond. This is the war zone. This is the mission field. This is the place that he left all of heaven behind to come to, to seek and to save the lost. And so Paul says, because this isn't all there is, because there is a hope of a future-looking assurance of something so much better in the face-to-face -face presence of the one who now lives in us through his spirit. We live with this assurance. Because of that, I don't have to use this life. I don't have to milk this life for every last little bit of pleasure and fun and enjoyment. I don't have to live for me because this is all I'm going to have. I'm set free to live for Him. I'm set free to live for you. That is the essence of Christianity. That we lose ourselves in love to God and love to humanity. I mean, what this is saying is nothing other than what Jesus said in Matthew 22. When the lawyer came to Him and said... Tell us which of, the, which of the commandments in the law is the greatest. And all Jesus said to him is very simply, it comes down to this, my friend. Everything else in the Old Testament, everything else in the New Testament, everything that every prophet, every, that, that Moses, that anybody has ever written in all of Scripture comes down to the simple principle, these two simple principles, love for God supreme and love for others as you would love yourself. If only we could understand that. Paul, in some strange way, elaborates on that and he says, It is hope that sets me free to love God. And it is hope that sets me free to love others. It is hope that enables me in the hardships and the difficulties of life to get up every morning and to keep going. The hope that nothing can take away because my hope is fixed in another world, in another place, in a being who was dead but now is alive, whom death cannot hold. Everything in this world can be taken away from you except the one thing that is outside of this world's grasp and that is Jesus Christ, God Almighty. So I ask you this morning, where is your hope? What are the things that you dream of? What are your aspirations in this life? Because if all your aspirations and all your dreams and all your hopes center in the things of this world, and there are things we look forward to in this world, how could you not? There are good things made by a good God, part of a good creation. Not everything has been destroyed by sin. There are good things. Of course, we hope for things in the worldly sense. There are things we look forward to. There are aspirations. But the human heart infested with sin takes the good things given by a good creator and it turns them into masters. It turns them into objects of worship, of supreme affection. It reprioritizes our life so that we're no longer anchored in the hope that's outside of this creation, but somehow we have fallen in love with the gifts that the good God gives. And we idolize them and we serve them. And they shape our characters and the way we treat other people. And God... The love for God is not supreme. And the love for others, well, we still love ourselves more than others. And it shapes our family's lives. It shapes the way we parent. It shapes the way our marriages exist between one another. It shapes church life. It shapes the way we are in the community. And so I'm going to ask you again, think about this. Where are your hopes anchored? 
the thoughts and the aspirations and the desires of your heart when you think about them, are they really based in this world and the things that you hope to accomplish, to obtain, the people that you invest in, your family perhaps, good things in the wrong order? So where are your hopes this morning? What kind of a difference would it make to have your hopes anchored in the God of eternity? And let me say it one more time in case you missed the importance of this. When your hopes are anchored outside of this created world, then there is nothing that the Lord of this world, the enemy of Christ, can do to destroy your hope. When your hope is anchored in Christ and in the eternal kingdom. There is nothing that the economic systems of this world can do to destroy your hope. You may have earthly disappointment. And things may not turn out down here the way you want them to turn out. But like Paul, you can say, Sure, I wish it was different. But it's not going to break me. It's not going to take away the reason I get up every morning. Because I still live with a trajectory. I still live in, with a direction. I'm still going with history towards a place. Towards a person. And death had tried to lay hold of him. But it could not hold him. And because he lives, I can face tomorrow. There's a beautiful hymn we're about to sing. It's called, In the Sweet By and By. You all know that song? Do you know the story to that song? The words are written by a man named, let me find his name here, Sanford Fillimore Bennett. Mr. Bennett wrote many hymns, many songs. And one of the people he worked most closely with is a man by the name of Joseph P. Webster. No relation of mine, to the best of my knowledge. Joseph Webster was a man who, in Mr. Fillimore or Mr. Bennett's uh, description, was a man who, who struggled with depression. He struggled with melancholy. And these two men had such a good and such a close relationship that that um, Mr. Bennett could walk into Mr. Webster's presence and without having to ask a question, he would know exactly where this man was. And he would sort of drift in and out of these depressive states. And sometimes he would be fine, and at other times he would be rather melancholy. And on the particular day when this hymn was written, Joseph came to visit Mr. Bennett. He was in his place of work and he walked into the office and Mr. Bennett was sitting behind the desk and Mr. Webster kind of walked into the office and simply turned his back and headed over to where the warm stove was and Mr. Bennett knew that his friend was struggling that day. He knew that he was struggling with melancholy, with a sense of sadness, with a sense of depression. And so he turned to him and this is his words, Webster, what is the matter now? To which Mr. Webster responded, it's no matter, he replied. It will be all right by and by. The idea of the hymn came to me like a flash of sunlight. And I replied, the sweet by and by. Why would that not make a great hymn? He asked Mr. Webster, who is the man who composed a number of the musical scores to the words that Mr. Bennett used to write. And what he had noticed was that any time he gave Mr. Webster lyrics to write music for, it lifted him up out of the gloominess, the melancholy, the depression. So do you see what's happening here? It'll be all right by and by, Mr. Webster says casually, not realizing what he's saying. Mr. Bennett realizes where he's at, and he realizes, is that not the beginning of a beautiful hymn? The sweet by and by. And as the story goes, he grabbed the pen and a piece of paper, and he just wrote down the, the verses to the song along with the chorus, and right there on the spot, he handed it to his friend Webster who immediately began to write down the notes to the song. 
And they say that within half an hour, the song was written and composed, and the two of them were singing it with two other friends. In the sweet by and by. Hope. That is what we hope for. This world is not a place of sweetness. We struggle as sinners. We suffer. And yet in Christ, we are made saints by His blood, for His purposes, through His mercy, with an end goal in sight, in the sweet by and by. So as we sing this song, I want to ask you again, where do your hopes, where do your hopes center? In this creation or in the sweet by and by? Amen.